Um, I can start uh, when you um, help you navigate some of the classes that may be a little challenging. So welcome, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carolyn Hall. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Dr. Carolyn Hall. I am the coordinator of assessment and continuous improvement at Cheney University. Um, I am in the building with the president, okay? So if you guys ever wanna come visit me, come holler. Mm -hmm. um, so today, what I really wanna talk to you about is a way to improve your skills in college composition, right? And you may say, well, Dr. Hall, what, uh, you know, you say you're the coordinator of assessment. How are you going to be teaching us about writing? Well, very easily, folks. For 16 years, I was a professor of writing. I taught at Clark Atlanta University, Spelman College, Fort Valley State University, uh, and Morris Brown College. And so um, I know some of the struggles that uh, many students have. And one of the biggest struggles that we often see students have is to make that transition from writing in high school to what it means to write as a college student, right? Because there is a difference. And sometimes you don't know the difference until you get that first paper back and you're like, but I made A's in high school and now I'm getting here and I'm struggling to get a passing grade on my, uh, on my essays and on my papers, right? Well, folks, you know, uh, college is advanced. And so there, the requirements for college level writing are going to be uh, more intense than the requirements for high school writing. They're going to be more intense than the requirements for high school writing. And so, um, and I can even tell you because before coming to Cheney, I, I taught in a high school. I worked in a high school for five years. I didn't teach the entire time, but I worked in a high school for five years. And one of the things that a lot of times students struggle with the most is uh, students in high school, mostly what they're writing, are they're writing summary papers, right? But when you get to college, what you're going to be really, really doing primarily is write, writing analysis papers. What is the response to what you read? Not a retelling of what you read, not a, re, not a summarization of what it is the teacher said or what, what it is the class discussed, but an analysis. How does, and when we talk about analysis, it's really important for you to remember that analysis is much deeper than summarization. It's much deeper than creating a summary. My slides won't change. Oh, I'm changing them on the wrong thing. Okay. Can you see the slides, Miss Tracy? Okay, there we go. So a lot of students say, well, um, I don't think writing should be that important because writing's not necessarily my strong suit. Um, I'm a math major, I'm a science major, I'm not going to be doing this in the future, but I want to tell you guys, that's all cap. Let me tell you why. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we're living in an environment where corporations, right, these jobs that hire you after college are looking for people that know how to write and critically, critically think. In fact, that, that, that when we talked about that whole analysis piece, analysis, when you're writing response papers in your college level courses, that's analysis. Analysis requires critical thinking. And so the very first place that a lot of these jobs are looking for your ability to be a critical thinker or an analytical thinker is what you write in the job applications, right? And so what they're saying is, is that now, 89% of employers, the people who hire you after college, the people who hire you during college, they are asking that universities place more emphasis on your writing skills, your writing and your communication skills, right? And so these things, this, this writing, this critical thinking, and this communication all go hand in hand, right? And so writing, if you want to be really, really honest about it, writing is really just you 
learning how to articulate what is in your mind and put it on paper. Articulation, when you hear somebody say she's very articulate, what that means is that that person knows how to clearly express themselves, right? That person knows how to clearly express themselves. The ideas that they put out are clearly expressed and people are able to easily understand them. So if you're writing a paper and you're making bad grades on your paper, what your teacher is essentially saying is that this paper is not been articulated. You've not clearly expressed your thoughts. You've not learned how to analyze or critically think about some of the things that we talked about in class. And that takes a required skill. The first required skill in terms of when you're writing, the first required skill when you're writing is understanding the assignment, right? Uh, I, I, I just love that because you know, we look at all these TikTok videos and, and in the background, they have somebody saying she understood the assignment. Well, unfortunately, folks, a lot of a lot of you guys are turning in papers and writing about things that you don't understand the assignment. Why? Because a lot of times we're missing out on doing the things that we're supposed to do. The first thing that we've always got to do when we're writing a paper when we're writing a paper, the very first thing that we've always got to do is we've got to determine the purpose, right? We've got to determine the purpose of the paper. What exactly is my teacher asking me to do as a student? What, what is my teacher saying that the assignment is, right? And usually what they're doing is they're asking you to respond to something that you read. They're asking you to research something or they're asking you to give your opinion on something based on what you've read, right? But the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to determine the purpose of the paper. Make sure that you've read the directions. Make sure that you look at the rubric. The rubric means the standard that is set for what, what makes an A paper, what makes a B paper, what makes a C paper, and what causes a paper to fail, okay? The second thing I want to make sure I do when I'm writing a paper for my composition course or any course for that matter, I need to make sure that I understand the questions that are asked in the assignment. Three, recognize any implied questions in the assignment. And what you say, Dr. Hall, what is an implied question? Implied questions are things that are not directly stated, right? They're things that the, the teacher or the author is inferring by what they wrote. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you guys are, um, your teacher, we're gonna pretend that the movie Baby Boy is a book, right? So in, uh, as a response paper, your teacher may say something like, um, how does Jody, how does the character of Jody, um, how is the character Jody symbolic of the title, right? And so essentially what we're knowing that the teacher, what we're doing is we've got to read between the lines. That's what implied means. I'm reading between the lines. So if she asked me, if the teacher asked me to write a paper that says how the character of Jody is a symbol for the title, baby boy, what she's asking me to do is to look at how that character represents what we think of as a baby instead of a man. Now, she didn't directly say that, but that is what she's saying. And so in that, the other imp implication or the other thing that is implied is I'm going to have to be able to explain what it means to be a baby boy. And I'm also going to have to point out specific examples from that movie slash book that validate, prove what I'm saying, okay? I got to point out specific examples that prove what I'm saying is true. The last thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we recognize what are the expectations for the assignment. Meaning, if your professor says to you that your paper has to be at least two pages typed, don't give the teacher uh, two pages tight with the 18 font. That's not two pages. 
Because what the teacher recognizing is you're trying to do uh, small tricks and techniques to make the paper look longer than it is, but it is not what was asked for. Because all teachers are usually going to ask for 12 point font times New Roman, double space, not triple space, not quadruple space, not 16 point font, not 14 point font, but 12 point font. They're also going to say, if the paper has to be typed, you can't turn in a handwritten paper, right? You've got to know what the expectations are and the expectations are usually given on the syllabus and the rubric. If you're writing a paper and the teacher says that one of the expectations is you've got to cite at least three sources in the paper, that does not mean plagiarize. It means that you've got to use three outside sources in your paper to validate that you've done some research. And you've got to cite those sources according to whatever style of documentation that your professor is asking for, okay? Next, after we understand the assignment, we've got to make sure we determine the purpose of our work, right? Determine the purpose of our work. And usually how we determine the purpose is, we're gonna make sure that we read thoroughly the directions of the assignment that are given. Read thoroughly the directions of the assignment that are given. And that starts with one, summarizing information, right? but your whole paper is not going to be a summary. It just means that you're going to go back over what it is that you read or what it is that was discussed in class. You're gonna make some notes and you're gonna make you sure that you include some of that in the context of your paper, right? That's a brainstorming exercise that should happen in the beginning of the writing process. Number two, analyze any ideas and concepts analyze any ideas and concepts that stand out. You said, well, Dr. Hall, how, do I, how am I supposed to know what stands out? Because you know what stands out by virtue of how much time an author spent explaining something or talking about something, right? For example, if we look at, because um, I don't know what books you guys have read or are reading. So uh, I know you all have seen Baby Boy because they show it every day on BET. Okay, especially in the summertime. So we're going to use go back to baby boy, right? So let's say that one of the concepts that we know in baby boy is that uh, Jody uh, is a baby, baby daddy. He impregnates a lot of women and gives them babies that he doesn't take care of. We see a lot about that because we see these different women who keep showing up at his job or anywhere that he is with a baby that, you know, that belongs to him. All right. So if we know that is something that the writer or director spent a lot of time on, we need to think about what does this mean overall in terms of the point that we're trying to make. Now, you remember in the beginning, I said the assignment was to explain how uh, um, the character Jody is emblematic, which means symbolic, right? An emblem for, he stands for the title baby boy. Well, one of the things we know about babies is that babies can't be held responsible for anything. They lack the fortitude. They lack the uh, they lack the the wherewithal to have responsibilities. Well, that's what we see in Jody. And so, if I'm saying this, I've got to point out specific ideas and concepts that actually happen in the text or in the movie that prove that what I'm saying is correct. The next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that my paper has a position on something and that I am defending it. Well, you said, Dr. Hall, what does it mean to take a position and defend it? When I'm taking a position on a paper, that means that I'm saying something. I need to make sure that I'm saying my opinion. Now, that does not mean, because remember, you're in college. College papers should never be written in first person unless unless you're writing a narrative or an autobiography and you're not doing it. Every paper should be written in third person. That means we should know at no point see, in my opinion, I think, I feel, I believe. No, it should always be written in third person. And so what happens is that helps the a reader to avoid formulating a biased perspective because you need to write it in a voice that says it's for all people, even though it's your opinion. So it, what does that look like? That looks like one might say that 
one, one often believes, many people have said throughout the course of the book, the writer suggests, notice I'm using third person pronouns, them, they, one, right? Those are pronouns that suggest third person. So this should be included in your writing, but you still should take a position. Um, let me tell you why this is important. Because a paper that argues two perspectives is a neutral paper. Got to pick one side and stay on it and argue that side. Doesn't matter if you don't think everybody's going to agree with you. What matters is, is that you have to prove your point through your ideas, concepts, and research. Okay. Next thing. Combine ideas and several sources to create your own argument. That does not mean that my paper is going to be full of other people's opinions or outside research. No, but it does mean that I put enough outside sources and research in my paper to strengthen the points that I'm making. Because as a student, even though I'm a scholar in training, I'm not an expert on anything as of yet. So I need to make sure that I see what the experts are saying about what it is that is being asked so that I can prove my point in a more uh, diplomatic fashion. Okay, so after I understand the assignment, now I need to know how do I respond? How do I respond to what is being asked of me? So if the teacher gives me this assignment, how do I respond, right? So most college writing assignments are either going to ask one of two questions, how or why, right? How does something happen or why something happened? Because what happens is, is that in both with both those questions, how and why, that means that you're going to have to write an analysis paper. It's going to require some critical thinking. That means that I'm going to have to be look beyond what was said to what was implied, right? And I'm going to give you another example of what that looks like. Let's pretend that uh, Savannah and I are having a conversation. And Savannah asked me, uh, does Savannah, give me, a, give me a fella's name. Give me a fella's name. James. James? Yeah. Okay. So Savannah, my, Savannah's my home girl, right? Savannah says, my first name is Carolyn, so I'm going to say Carolyn. Savannah says, Carolyn, I'm really feeling James. Like, I see him every day in the cafeteria. He's like super fly. Like, every time I see him, you know, he got that drip. Oh, I'm feeling him, right? So she was like, what you think? What you think? So I say to her, let me talk to him, right? So I come back from having talked to James and I tell Savannah, and Savannah, I still need you to be present because you're gonna tell me what, what's happening here, right? So I come back to Savannah after I've talked to James and I say, and she said, what happened girl? What'd he say, what'd he say? And I say to Savannah, well, you know, he's, he's think you're real cool or whatever, but you know, he like, you know, he got some other stuff going on. He ain't trying to talk to nobody right now. Like, but he think you cool though. Savannah, what is Jane? What, what am I telling you about James? You telling me that, well, basically I can, I can get from what that you're telling me is that he kind of like, he kind of a liar and he don't really own his stuff. He got to make excuses and all that stuff. He claimed that he handled in this. I don't know, like, if you really can't tell a girl straight up that you don't want her, I don't know. Like if you can't tell the truth or something, you gotta I'm like, really, I'm really telling you James ain't feeling you like that. But I'm yeah, trying to like you just saying, like you just like you know, like you really trying to be nice about him, like curving me kind of. Right. So I'm trying to so, tell you he don't like you without hurting yeah. your feelings, right? Now, did I say yeah. James don't like you, girl? Did I say mm -hmm. that? No, I'm just using excuses for it. Not excuses, we want to use academic language. Uh -oh. It was implied by what I said, uh, yeah, does that make yeah. sense? Okay, yeah. so it was not directly stated, it was implied, okay? Yeah, it was implied. It, there we go. So what happens is, is that when you're reading these assignments, folks, most times when the teacher asks you, well, what is the author trying to say? They're not asking you to repeat 
what the author said, what they're asking you is what is implied? What were they really meaning even though they didn't say it? What were we to infer from what they said? Okay, and so these are the sorts of things that go into the context of your paper, because as a college student, teachers are not really interested in you summarizing a paper. In fact, most of the things that they're teaching you, they've read 70 million times, okay? So they're not asking you to give them a summary. What they want for you to do is to tell them what is the author trying to say here? What is the author trying to uh, get us to believe. I want to sort of give you an example if I can, right? I'm going to give you an example that I think will really um, Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of an example because I really want to drive this point, point home. Okay, this is one of my favorite poems. Um, and this is a poem by Langston Hughes called I Too, right? So we're looking at this poem and the poem is really, really short, but it's, it's got so much stuff in it. It's layers and layers of stuff in this. So let's say that I'm your teacher, right? And I have you read this poem. And my question to you is, you're going to write a two-page paper that explains what is Langston Hughes really saying about America in this poem, OK? The, this is the kind of assignment that teachers would use to give. You're going to write a two-page essay explaining what is Langston Hughes really saying about America in this poem, OK? So this is where we talk about, this is how we talk about an, an analytical thinking and critical thinking and implied meanings, all right? So I'm gonna read the poem, it's really short, but I want, and I want, so we're gonna have some call and response. I'm gonna ask you guys some questions. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. So if I were your teacher, I would ask, write a two page paper explaining what Langston Hughes is saying about America. Write a two page paper explaining what Langston Hughes is saying about America. Now, even though it is never directly stated, the first thing that we know is a, is a, is a theme here is racism. Does, it, does he anywhere in the poem say anything about racism, anybody? No. Okay. Well, where Not am I getting now. Okay, so where am I getting that from that this poem is about racism? When the, um, they send me to eat in the kitchen. And when he said he was I a brother. A when he say I'm the darker brother, right? Yeah. He says, I'm the darker brother. And he's, they send me to eat in the kitchen, right? Now I'm gonna tell you what else a scholar would do, right? The scholar in me would research the time frame that this poem was written. The time frame that the poem was, cause, he, cause see somebody else, right? Cause we scholars up in here, all right? Let's keep it a buck 50, we scholars. So somebody else would say, how am I supposed to write a two page essay on a poem that ain't got but 12 lines? Very, very easily. Because the first thing I'm gonna do is as a scholar, I understand that everything has context. Everything has context. So the first thing that I'm going to do, if I'm really going to understand what the author is implying with this poem, not directly stating, but what he's implying in this poem is, I'm going to look up the time frame that the poem was written, right? And so let's say,
Okay, so Langston Hughes wrote this poem in 1926, right? Now, what was happening in America for black people in 1926? Segregation. Jim Crow, segregation. They were only about 60 years out of slavery. So for, 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 for just to be quite honest, uh, in some parts of the country, and we'll get into this another day, I'm about to blow your minds. In some parts of the country, people were still enslaved, but they called it sharecropping, okay? So in some parts of the country, people were still enslaved. So what happens is he's talking about what black people have gone through in spite of the fact that, because what, what do people say about America? The good thing they say about America. They be saying like it's the land of the free. It's the land of the free. It's a melting pot. You could come here and be successful. And those things have truth, but we know that it looks a whole lot different for people who look like this, for black and brown people, right? That means it's impossible for us, but it means that it's different, right? And I also want you to take note of something because this is full of symbolism. Oh, I love it. It's full of symbolism, right? Notice he says, I'll be at the table, right? Where else have you heard the term at the table? Where else have you heard that before? I know one of y'all scholars got this now. Where else have you heard the term at the table? What, what table mean like, uh, like, the, like what they say, like what you bring to the table? I like that, Thomasina, but even bigger than that, guess what? When they people talk about having a seat at the table, right? Like, let's say, for instance, Tom, Thomasina is trying to get into the tech industry, right? And we know there are not a whole lot of black and brown people in the tech industry. And Thomasina says, I just need a seat at the table, right? A seat at the table means I need to be a part of the people who make decisions, a part of the power structure, right? But what do we know? He's not at that table, is he? Because they sending him to the kitchen to eat. And so do you see how all of this adds up to explaining racism, but he does it with symbolism instead of uh, direct words? Are you still, is everybody still following? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you see how this, how you see how this would really turn into a good paper if we broke this thing down. And so this is more than us summarizing. This means we're putting on our thinking caps and we're really, really analyzing what is this author saying, right? And that's where main ideas, see, this is a problem because in high school, a lot of times when they teach students about main ideas, they'll tell, they'll say, well, what was the, um, what was the author saying in this text? That automatically leads to summary. No, main idea, main idea, and I'm going to put it in the chat. The main idea is the author's overall implied idea. The author's overall implied idea. That's what a main idea is. It is the author's overall implied idea, right? Now, you say, well, because I would have students who would try to argue about they, their papers if they got like a C or something, they would say, well, if it's my opinion, no, it's not, it's bigger than just your opinion because you see how the implied meaning, I told you that the implied message here was about racism and you all immediately got it. Even though that was my perspective, right? It was a correct perspective and it was backed up by what the author said. This can't be just me talking out the side of my neck. I've got to be able to validate, which means to prove what it is that I'm saying through the context of the ideas and exemplars that the writer is giving in their work. And that is what I talk about in my paper, right? So guys, I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask you some questions. Is this making it kind of um, easier to understand when we talk about 
what college level essays are really asking you to do? Yes. yes. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? Like, well, Dr. Hall, how do I get started? You know, when I write these essays, like, does anybody have any questions so far? Well, I have trouble writing essays sometimes. So Oops, I'll go sorry, with go Erica ahead. first and then I'm gonna come back up to uh, Savannah. Go ahead, Erica, tell me. And I... Okay, so I, I suck at writing papers. So no, like, you don't take that out my... your vocabulary. Take it out. Okay, I'll take it out my vocabulary. But I'm having trouble writing papers, and we actually have a paper coming up soon for my, my English class, and mm -hmm. we're talking about poems as well. Um, we're going off of a couple poems that she wants to go off of, but it's, I don't know. I guess I just have trouble, like, I, was, I can start it and put everything in one paragraph. It's the stretching it part that I okay. have trouble with, I guess. So let me see if I can create a blackboard, right? I want you to go, uh, and, and I want you to think you're done for doing this, because let me tell you something. I've written a dissertation for my doctorate. I've written seven books. And every time I start a project, do you know I have to brainstorm like I'm in elementary school? And let me tell you why. I do that because if you don't brainstorm and get a strategy for how you're going to write, you'll end up saying the same thing over and over again and getting brain fog. Everything that you write has to have a strategy. It's got to have a strategy. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, I can't put a, um, this one doesn't have a blackboard capacity. So let me do it. Let me make a blank sheet of paper so I can show you what that looks like. You mean a whiteboard? Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's up up at the top. You oh. see whiteboard? Yeah. I don't. I wonder if I can put it up and you do it. Does yeah, would you? Okay. Um. Can you see it? I can. Okay. Let me see. I never used the whiteboard, so. <laughs> it won't let me write on it, Miss Tracy. Won't let me write oh. on your whiteboard. Oh. Well, um, I'm gonna come back out and if you'll go back and look, it's at the top row. And it's- Okay. Um, Cause I did let you share. Let me come out of this. And you say the top row. So the top left is us. Uh huh. And the next one is screen two. That's something I have. And then the next one is the whiteboard. I have I have none of that. Okay. Um, nope. I'm just gonna have to go old school and get a sheet of paper and show show everybody what I'm talking about. Okay. and go back to share screen. Okay, so let's say we, we're going back to I2 Sing America, right? I2 by Langston Hughes. Let me make this font bigger so y'all can really see. And I'm gonna show you how my writing process really looks. I2 by Langston Hughes. Okay. And so the assignment is Okay. So does this look kind of similar to like a writing assignment that your teacher would give? Would they give an assignment like that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. Okay. So your assignment is to write a two-page paper, write a two-page paper about racism in America based on Langston Hughes I2, right? So as we think about that poem, what are some things? 
we think about Langston Hughes poem and we think about racism, what are some things that come to mind? Throw some words at me. Because what we're doing now is called uh, brainstorming. So give me some words that come to mind. Now I'm writing down the things that come to my mind. What what are some things that come to you all's mind? When you think about the poem. Is it weird that I thought of a movie? Okay, what movie? The Django. Okay. Mm. Can I use another poem? You another poem comes to mind? Yes. Okay, what's the um, other poem? Actually, the poem that I'm I'm working on in class. It's called We Are the Mask. My we, we wear the mask Long by Claude Summer. McKay. I love mm -hmm. that one too. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was talking about the one by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Okay, Angela. So, what what's some other things that come to mind? That come to mind. Um, not really being free, but free, I guess. Mm. Okay, so here, right here, I have brainstorming. If I had more time, I would do more, more brainstorming, but I'm doing this in general, just to give you, you guys an idea of how I start my writing process, right? So I have these words that came to mind when I was thinking about the poem. I got racism, segregation, Jim Crow, systemic racism, black poet in the night. 1920s to Django, Powerless Prejudice, Inferior Treatment, We Wear the Mask by Claude McKay, Mistreatment of Blacks, Not Really Being Free, Being Invisible, America's Supposed to Be the Land of Opportunity, Freedom, American Pie. These are all things that come to mind, right? Now, in order to narrow this down, now this doesn't mean I can't use the rest of this stuff, right? But of these ideas, which three are the broadest? Which three are the broadest ideas? Meaning the biggest ideas. Which of these three are the biggest, broadest Ooh, ideas? Racism. I would say racism is the is the first one. Okay. That's one. Uh-huh. Um, well, not really being, I don't know. We could probably say like um. I don't know. We could tie in like with being invisible and not really being free and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Like some of the points. I don't know. We just gotta generalize that down with something. But because like prejudice, I don't know. Like they are some good points. So, so we'll say we'll we'll keep racism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say invisibility is another one, and the last mm -hmm. one, Erica. Since you got us started, Erica, give me a last one. Um, I was going to say systematic racism, mm -hmm. but I didn't well, know that collaborated with racism. That's why it I does. Didn't really... It does. And we, we want to avoid repetition. Okay. So we got racism, being invisible. And also, I'm going to say. Um, Should we talk I about the human of blacks? 
cuts get the power of this tie in with like being invisible. Mm. At first, I was going throwing some with economics and stuff. Okay, so I like and I'm like. gonna take these three things and I'm gonna make a, a thesis statement, right? I'm going to take these three things and make a thesis statement. And remember, because the thesis statement is what we call a working thesis. That means that during the course of my writing, I could change the thesis, but in general, it's going to sort of remain the same, but I just want to make sure that I have three clear points because usually teachers are asking for a five body, a five paragraph essay, introduction, three body paragraphs, conclusion. This is what they're usually asking for. And so first paragraph is always an introduction. The three body paragraphs are going to be the three points that come from the thesis. So to keep it simple, I like to have a thesis that has three points so that I can have that paper pretty much already written. And that paper, that thesis, however, needs to mirror what was said in the, uh, in the uh, writing prompt that was given by the teacher. So this is gonna be my thesis. Okay, so we got, this is my working thesis. I might change it a little bit, but what happens is this helps me to have basically my body written because now I've got what it is I'm gonna talk about in each of my body paragraphs. Body paragraph number one is going to talk about racism. Body paragraph two is gonna talk about invisibility. Body paragraph three is gonna talk about economic disparities. And I answered what was said in the prompt. I understood the assignment because she's saying that she wants me to talk about what this, what this poem is really saying about racism in America. So my thesis statement says, Langston Hughes, I too examines the issues of racism, invisibility and economic disparities heaped against blacks in America. Simple to the point, but it all started with a brainstorm. Is everybody still following? Mm -hmm. so now yeah. because yes. i want to i want to make sure that i don't run into what erica said which is where all this could be put in one paragraph now what i need to do is i need to get myself a working outline i'm going to take this thesis and i'm going to create an outline okay so in that outline, this is still this is still me brainstorming. In that outline, I need to Okay, so here I go, right? So now in this introduction, I've told you exactly what it is that I'm going to do in the introduction paragraph. I'm gonna give a little bit of a background on Langston Hughes that may be one or two sentences. 
I'm going to tell a little bit about the climate in America when Hughes wrote the poem. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the symbolism in the poem and give a thesis statement. That right there is five to seven sentences, a good, healthy introduction, right? Mm. So if the first point in my thesis statement is racist, racism, body and paragraph number two, which is body paragraph number one, is going to talk about Okay. So do you see how with this outline already, I'm breaking down my paper and then I'm giving my paper a focus, a specific focus, and it all points back to the poem. Mm -hmm. Is anybody seeing this? And this looks a whole lot different in summary because I'm not just repeating back to you what Hughes is saying, but the whole intent is for me as a scholar, is to tell what the author is implying. What is he saying without directly stating it? What is what, when he gives me all of this symbolism in the poem, what do these symbolism mean? Talking about people working in the kitchen. Well, one of the things we should know, we should have learned from history class is during that particular time frame, the 1920s, that uh, a lot of black people worked as domestic servants. So even that symbolism meant something, right? I can include that in my paper in some way that talks about how a lot of them were relegated or made to do domestic work, no matter how educated they were. That's something that can go in the paper and validates what he's saying, even though he's talking about race in a very symbolic fashion, right? And so, but, but in order for any of this to happen, I've got to make sure I get a structure for my paper before I do any of this. Everybody still on the same page with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it making a little bit more sense? Yes. yes. Okay. Anybody have any questions about anything that I said so far? Well, folks, this is, it's time for us to wrap this up, but um, I want you to make sure that you're doing these things. So I'm gonna go back through really, really quickly because I believe in a good wrap up, right? So number one, Make sure that you understand the assignment. That means that you got to thoroughly read the directions that your professor has given, right? That also means that you've got to look at that rubric, whatever it is that the details are for that particular assignment and understand what the expectations are. If they say it's got to be two pages type, that means two pages, not a big Flintstone font, but 12 point times New Roman. That means that I can't try to plagiarize my paper, but that means that they're trying, they're asking me to explain my level of comprehension about what it was that I read. Number two, you need to make sure that before you start writing, that you brainstorm, jot down all the ideas that come to mind about the reading, even if you connect them with other things that you've read or you've seen that further your point, but you gotta make sure that it furthers the point to be made about what the teacher's asking. If it's too much of, I gotta find a way to grasp and I gotta ask you what you mean, then that's not a good paper because you're not gonna be there when I grade it. So I don't have time to ask you, what were you trying to say right here? If I got to do that, mm -mm. It should be evident. Remember the word I used in the beginning is that it should articulate, right? Which means to express clearly, easily to understand, right? Okay. 
Number three, create an outline after you brain, after you do this little brainstorm. Make sure you create an outline because the outline is going to give you a skeletal structure for your paper. Number four, you want to then write the paper, but you need to make sure that you write and rewrite and rewrite again to get rid of grammatical errors. That's easy to get rid of, right? But make sure that the structure makes sense. And most times your teacher doesn't have, unlike high school, nobody's going to look at the paper before you turn it in. We're not working with that kind of time. People don't have that kind of time. They really don't have that kind of time in high school, right? But you need to either go to the writing center or get one of your friends who's a really good writer to do a peer review with you. They look over your paper, don't get all sensitive, don't explain to them what you were trying to say, let them look over the paper and say, this needs to be added here. This needs to be, this needs to be happening here because you can't get sensitive about the paper and explain to them because the te- you're not going to be there when the teacher grades the paper, okay? So guys, I hope that this helped. Um, we're going to do some more of these, you know, and next time it may even be helpful if you bring an actual paper that we could look at, Right? So, but I hope this helps. I hope this gives you some semblance of order. And I really enjoyed you guys and thank you for coming, okay? Yeah. Thank um, you. Dr. Hall, um, thank you. Savannah said this um, you have really, a good one. really helpful. So um, hopefully um, we can do this again. And I wanted to know, whoop, <laughs> is there any way we could have those notes that you just- that Yes, you, ma'am, you sure can. Because I think it would help me if they come to me and would like some help. I think I learned a lot. Just okay, to, awesome. You can have those notes, and then maybe you know we can share them with you, and and um, all of you can share that. Well, this is how you do it, because this is what Dr. Hall said you have to do. This is the format. So um, I'm definitely going to let Dr. Um, Collins and Dr. Pollard know that um, that you've come. And like I said, I hope no one minds me putting their name because I'm going to give y'all all a shout out on on the hub and um maybe we could do this again dr hall okay i would love to and erica don't ever say that again what you said in the beginning right yes uh, you have to say what how, how are we going to change this how are we going to change this oh. we're going to say that. um wait um i have a comment um can you put your um email in the um chat please i sure can i sure can Thank you. But guys, I, okay, they stop calling. Okay, and uh, Savannah, is this a smize? You said a who? Am I smizing? <laughs> like yeah. your picture. You look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right, guys, you guys have a good one and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so you much. Too. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Bye. This is great.